I like to call this story an apology to the people I drove here. I tell it in three parts. Part one. When I was 14, I was in the back seat of a 1989 Monte Carlo with my best friend Ian and my good friend Kelly Rhoda. She was driving, Ian was in the passenger side, and I was in the back seat with one of those like one strap belts DJing from the back seat on a cassette player. <clears throat> and we were getting on 93 North in Boston, but it was one of those parts of the highway where you have to merge onto the high speed lane. So we took this 1989 Monte Carlo, and we revved it up real fast to get in there and merge. And we hit a piece of black ice at the top of the, the ramp and the car spun around entirely 180 degrees and we were now traveling backwards on a highway at 65 miles an hour. At which point I see the station wagon that was coming towards us. And I see the man looking at me and I am looking at him and I see him looking at me, looking at him and he sees me looking at him, looking at me. And I'm thinking, I'm gonna die. And that's the point at which I realize Kelly Rhoda is a NASCAR driver in disguise because she pops the car into drive, jams the wheel onto the side and we slide three lanes over into the breakdown lane and we come to a complete stop, and that was the day I started smoking. <laughs> Episode number two. I turned 16. I'm going to take my driver's test. My dad drops me off in my 1984 Dodge Colt four-speed. It's gold, and it is beautiful, and the clutch is like butter. And that's what you need when you're gonna be taking your driver's test in a standard transmission. For those of you that are young in the world, that's one of those sticky things that works. And so I've been driving sick for a very long time. My dad taught me when I was a really little kid, I would sit in the passenger side and he would push the clutch in and I would move it with my uh, left hand, which is different than moving it with your right hand. But I was prepared. I went and I took my test. I passed it with flying colors. I went out and I got into the Dodge Colt. I put the key in the ignition and I waited. And then this gigantic black state trooper from Massachusetts with the gigantic hat and like he was, he was six foot two, he was 280 pounds and he does not fit into a 1984 Dodge Colt at all. He gets in, his knees are up on the dashboard, like he's all up there, he's got his clipboard balanced on it and he has me pull out and I'm feeling like, I'm feeling like oh, it's okay because I know how to do this. So I'm doing great, 10 and two, follow the speed limit, I'm down. We pull into this little side, area. He says, well, I'd like you to turn around. I'm in a 1984 Dodge Colt. No problem. I turn that wheel and I make a little Yui. No big deal. He looks at me. I look at him. He looks at me looking at him and I look at him looking at me. And he says, son, I wanted you to do a K turn. I said, oh, now I'm thinking to myself, I learned how to drive in a 1984 Dodge Colt. <laughs> I don't know what a K-turn is. I got a turning radius. This is why you buy a small car. It goes around in a little Yui real easy. So I learned what's called the lowercase U-turn. I'm like, all right, sir, no problem. So I do another Yui, but then I stop my car and I put it in reverse. And in a four speed, you have to kind of pick up that little knob and then pull it over and push it up. And then I back up for a few feet and I'm like, see, look, I can make a U-turn and then back up right afterwards. He looks at me, I look at him, he looks at me looking at him, I look at him looking at me. And he puts a check mark on it and I've got a license now. <laughs> that was a big problem. <laughs> Episode number three, I'm a senior in college. My best friend Rob and I decide that the best thing to do this evening is to drink an entire case of Foster's oil cans together. <laughs> now those of you who don't know what Foster oil cans are, those are not the regular size beers, these are the Australian for beer beers. After completing all 20 of the Foster's oil cans, we decide that that is not sufficient alcohol for our inebriation state. So I make a poor decision, and I will tell you, do not make this poor decision, not tonight, not ever. But I got in Rob's car, and Rob hands me the keys because he says, Rich, I am too drunk to drive. And I'm like, no problem, dude! I got this! I look at him, looking at him, he looks at me. I'm looking at him, looking at me, he's looking at me, looking at him. I'm like, let's go down and get some more alcohol for our inebriation. The good news of this story is I corrected myself. Two and a half miles from that position, 
I pull the car to a complete stop, get out of the car, pull the keys out of the ignition, and throw them into the woods. <laughs> Rob, I am too drunk to drive. So he and I go and sit at the side of a river uh, that we were at uh, with the car, and suddenly we see the blue and red lights. Now, interestingly enough, you cannot be pulled over for drunk driving if you are not in the vehicle and you do not have the keys. <laughs> This is an important factor in my situation. So fundamentally what happens is Rob crawls into the back of the car and passes out because he definitely was too drunk to drive. I, on the other hand, have to negotiate with the officer about having to crawl into the back of the car and get Rob's wallet out of the back of his rear end and pull out the uh, AAA card so that I can get the tow truck to tow the car that was in the center of the road. And in neutral, surprisingly back to the house and thankfully close call i didn't get pulled over so for those of you who drove with me today where i was driving my deepest deepest apologies